Welcome to Ideas Live, the show where we have a deep conversation about a particular topic. I'm Anne Marie Oman, and this is my co host, Karen Anderson. And we have embarked on a series of shows that we're simply titling under the umbrella of Ways to Help. And part of this came out of our awareness that there are so many people in need and there are so many people who are suffering right now, both individually as families and locally and regionally and also in the larger world. And we each have our own favorite places where we hope we are in some way helping. But it occurred to us that it might be really beneficial to have this larger picture and talk to people about very specific ways to help. Mm -hmm. That maybe part of what keeps us from helping is simply that we're anxious about the responsibility and we're, we're, we don't know quite what to do. So in this regard, I was particularly interested in ways of, because I love food, <laughs> I celebrate with food. You grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm, and I grew up with, with um, you know, gardens and fields and gardens and fields and tractors. And so I was particularly interested in ways to help people have enough to eat and that aspect, and not only have enough to eat, but to have good food. Yeah. Yeah. And so the questions of hunger are, mm -hmm. are behind this particular mm -hmm. show, and the questions of how we not just feed others when we have enough to eat, but mm -hmm. how we help people feed themselves, mm -hmm. which I think with all the concerns about um, places now where there are, are there's food, the lack of food, even in cities, mm -hmm. because so many grocery stores have closed, or so many, there's all that's left are the, the little markets on a strip mall. And lack of particularly healthy food. I right, mean, right. I think our awareness of what's healthy has increased. Right. And so then we see that the difference between junk food and healthy food and right. what's available. And what's available, and particularly the expense of much of that food that is not very good for us mm -hmm. and the, the, the preservatives and all of that. So the big question of how do you get good food to people who need good food and how do you do it in such a way that it doesn't remove their dignity? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's one of the big questions is food has to have an integrity around it. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe I'm speaking out of luxury terms, but it feels to me like when somebody can put food from their gardens on their own plate and that that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. That don't you feel good when you have your own tomato? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. My yeah. own arugula. It's my most successful crop. Oh, you yeah. have arugula. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> Thank you. That's, but yeah, there is a satisfaction about that. Or even supporting local farmers. I mean, uh, knowing where yes. your food comes from and knowing yes. people who provide it I, is, is yes. a different experience. So I wanted to get inside that question of food and field ways and to help. Way, as a way to help. And so I became interested in um, an old friend who uh, has founded this organization called Buckets of Rain. And I think now that we should get him in here. Great. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Ideas Live. I'm Anne-Marie Oman, and this is my co-host, Karen Anderson. And today we are continuing our um, umbrella episodes on ways to help, and I'm honored to have with me Chris Skellinger, an old friend who is the director of a nonprofit organization called Buckets of Rain, which is related to the conversation that we introduced earlier about my interest as a, a way, one of the ways to help being feeding people and helping people get the food that they need and um, making gardens. And so welcome, Chris. Thanks for being Thanks here. Thanks so much. So first of all, Buckets of Rain, uh, lots of people know about it, but some people don't. So why don't you just explain the mission and then how, a little bit of the story of how this organization evolved. Okay. Well, maybe I'll start from the present and work backwards. But, okay. Uh, uh, since 2012, we've been focusing on, on Detroit. 
uh, and Highland Park. Highland Park is actually worse than Detroit. Detroit's coming back a little bit. Highland Park still kind of stuck in its ways. Uh, but what we do there is we take a blighted, abandoned property, clean it up, and turn it into food production. Uh, we have about an acre and a half down there, 30-some city lots mm -hmm. uh, that we've cleaned up. And the food that we grow there is given free to the homeless shelter kitchens of the Detroit Rescue Mission and let's say Cass Community Social Services and anybody else who needs it at the time. We also give to the neighborhood and uh, <clears throat> and to anybody anybody who, nobody goes away hungry. So anybody right. who walks up to the okay. fence. So, so we have community gardens and we have a production garden. You know. Okay, uh, what is the difference? Um, nobody's allowed in the production garden. I see, yeah. so that's about creating produce. Yes. yes. Um, uh, only, only partially because you know we're not completely organic, uh, but we can't. But when we when we wall off the production mm -hmm. garden, you're walling off your neighbors. There are, our neighbors, if they don't have our back, we don't have nothing. So we put self serve gardens in the same neighborhood around this production one. So it's like, can I come in and get something? It's like, no, not today. But you can walk 200 feet that way and pick all day long if you want. And you know, be like, so the production Where? garden is yeah. for. Is for the homeless shelters okay. and our various programs, yeah. And and then we have community ones too, so that people can uh, do their but own what thing. But what a wonderful way to do it! It's a div you know, it's like this one is is for the people who can't have a garden. This mm -hmm. one is for you. Mm -hmm. I get mm -hmm. it. Okay, mm -hmm. that's really an interesting. And it sounds like it sounds a little difficult at first. It must have been a real process to make that decision. It was because we had to figure out. Uh, all of a sudden, we had a new group of gardeners, so to speak, you know, the community. Right, right. And I didn't really, I'm not, you know, I, when I first got there, I, I was I'm quite a stranger to the inner city culture of Detroit. I mean, why would I know anything about that? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, the first year, I lived in a homeless shelter uh, so that I could, could see what I was getting myself into. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's, it's just How been... How long did you live with them? Uh, for a season, a growing yeah. season, yeah. 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 Had, had my own room there, you know, uh -huh. so I was passing by and list, getting to know the nature of homelessness, especially these were amongst veterans, so right. I didn't get the whole, you know, the whole picture, but I got a, a pretty, good, uh, wow. pretty good snapshot of it. And, uh, and then over time, we've, we, we are now part of the community as opposed to just another, you know, a, another project that everyone's uh, kind of sitting and yeah. waiting is like, well, how long before this one caves in too? Right, you know? right. Um, so we're in our seventh uh, <clears throat> seventh year. Great. There, so. so you were telling the story of Buckets of Rain, and I, I sidetracked you, but you, you said that there's a story before the story, before mm -hmm. the 2012 when you began to focus exclusively on Detroit. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, Buckets of Rain was once called Eleven Oaks. Eleven Oaks, yeah. Eleven yeah. Oaks. So, what, how did that lead you to the whole food thing, or what? What is that about? Um, Eleven Oaks was left purposely vague when we filed our nonprofit status, you know, because we didn't really know where this journey was going to take us. And we had Eleven Oaks lining our driveway to the to the farm when we had the big mm -hmm. bigger farm out on Six Sixty Nine, uh, and so we started in. Uh, Africa and Central America, but the primarily the reason we started was because my wife Susan and I had a had a small mom and pop landscaping operation, and so we we're like only one injury away from being out of business. And when mm. that happened, it's like, okay, now what are we going to do? I say, well, we've got 50 years experience in making things grow, even though most of our work has been doing second houses on Glen Lake, which is mm -hmm. an incredibly important link in this story eventually. Uh, but Susan comes up with this guidepost article, okay, you know, miracle number one, and she goes, you gotta read this. And it was about uh, Richard Chapin and Chapin Living Waters that was doing bucket, bucket kit irrigation in dry land Africa. That's right. And how to take excess water and feed a family of four with a five gallon bucket and so on. She says, you gotta call this guy. <laughs> this is, you know, still kind of shy. Well, he's on a magazine. He must be like, he doesn't have time to talk to us, you know. Oh, but uh, yeah, he answered the phone mm -hmm. <laughs> and convinced me to go with him to the Echo Global Research Farm in Florida in a couple of months. He goes because before you throw your hat over the fence, you need to you need to meet the people who real mm -hmm. who do this, mm -hmm. and and they'll tell you, you know, what kind of sacrifices you can be ex expected to to make. 
and uh, so I was his sidekick. He was 80, 89 years old at the time, mm -hmm. and so I would carry his gear with one hand and have his wife mm -hmm. had her hand on my arm the other way, and he continued to do this until he was 94. But anyway, meeting with Mr. Chapin, uh, he set us up with some contacts. Mm -hmm. You know, again, one of the, I think, more important things we're going to talk about today is how you, you just can't throw, you know, throw darts at a... Right. Ed balloons and and see what happens. It's a methodical process of working your way networking. So then you the focus switched to Detroit. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Um, but if I can backtrack to Africa just a little bit, you know, Africa has two seasons: they have wet and dry. I see. And during dry, diets would switch back to whatever the World Food Organization was dropping off. All grains. Okay. So all of a sudden you had a complete diet, nu nutritional sweet and now you're eating oatmeal for instance mm. that makes people sick mm. so what we tried to do with mr chapin's help is show people that you can grow vegetables all year long if you manage your water correctly and you've got one of these little kits so it was almost it was more of a hope thing it's like we don't have to get sick because we're not getting uh, tomatoes and, and onions and peppers mm -hmm. and stuff we can we can maintain our health and of course when that happens uh, when you're when you're healthy and feel good and your brain is working on all cylinders, you know, mm -hmm. then stuff starts starts right. to happen. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> then you can do the good work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. So then it gets us to Detroit eventually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what was the transition like? Well, the moment <laughs> was well. First of all, it was, it was becoming obvious too that we didn't understand enough about Africa and the cultural ways there to, you know, and we weren't we didn't have boots on the ground. You gotta have boots on the ground uh, of people you can trust, mm -hmm. and we weren't just we just weren't able to make that connection in a tribal situation where all of a sudden Anglos sure. show up and start to uh, start to mill about and tarry in in, in tribal you know mm -hmm. cultures. Um, mm. Okay. Uh, so, so it didn't have a lasting effect. Is that what you're saying? It didn't. <clears throat> Well, it did, but of course, you know, it's never as good as you want it to be. Sure. You know, okay. uh, the other thing with that, with that in Lesotho in southern Africa, was they had they had in a, it were in the midst of a seven-year drought, okay. mm. <laughs> and so we, what I say, inoculated maybe thirty communities throughout the country with access to drip irrigation, mm -hmm. and in, and instruction, and working, you know, uh, based out of churches and schools and, and right, hospitals. Right. Right. And then, Sounds like you did a lot. Yeah, a lot in, in, in the, the three seasons we were there. And then it rained for five straight years. Oh, of course. <laughs> so drought was no longer a problem. The crops were washing away. Oh, So okay. our technology went on the shelf, and mm -hmm. then now they're back in a period of drought. And, and to, to the best of my knowledge, because we get contacted occasionally, you know, from people mm -hmm. in, in Africa, and, and they're, they're, they're back they, they understand okay. drip irrigation sure. now, and okay. I don't know how big of a role we well, had in that, go. but it certainly mm -hmm. certainly didn't hurt any, mm -hmm. you know, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then you came to focus on Detroit. Okay, yeah. We were given one of our talks, you know, at a, at a home for retired Methodist ministers in, I think it was in Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. And um, got all done, and a little old lady, about yay high, comes up and she points, shakes her finger at me, and she goes, have you ever been to Detroit? And I'm like, well, yeah, I was born there, but I haven't been there in 40 years. And she goes, you need to go meet Faith Fowler. And like, I took her pretty seriously. Uh -huh. And uh, usually when somebody does that, they, they're working on, you know, uh, they got information that you need to have. Right. So we did. We went and we, and we uh, got, made an appointment with Faith Fowler, who's the head of uh, CAS Community Social Services. Uh, both Cass Community and Detroit Rescue Mission have been around for 70 to 100 years, so <clears throat> they, uh, they know what they're doing. We met with her, and, uh, but the most important thing was on the road to meet her. You know, I'm from Waterford, uh, but I haven't been there since 1974. But, so we drove down, Sue and I drove down Woodward Avenue mm -hmm. and turned right onto Glendale in Highland Park. And mm -hmm. everything changed I at know, that moment. I know exactly where you were. Yeah, it was it was uh, apocalyptic. The destruction the destruction of that area. Mm -hmm. uh, all the all the businesses on on Woodward from Highland Park within mm -hmm. the boundaries were closed. The buildings were burnt and collapsing right on Woodward. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> there was uh, two inhabited structures in three blocks. So it's like, this, this is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, this is where we're supposed to be. And uh, we worked with Faith Fowler. And yet there and was still a population there. A very little. The oh. Most of the, probably only 20 to 30 percent of the houses were occupied. Right. The rest were burnt and boarded up. Okay. Uh, so because we had learned in Africa and Central America that we need to have the strongest partners possible, then we, we started working with the Detroit Rescue Mission and CAS community. Actually, we eventually we gravitated towards Detroit Rescue Mission because they had land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. They had land you know, that they didn't even know they owned, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the fact that they owned it, and then they were able to go, here, just all yours. You know? okay. Clean it up and let's go to town. Let's start okay. Too much of the food for those shelters comes out of cans. You know, mm -hmm. so, right, uh, right, boxes. right. I'm just so amazed by this commitment to the fresh food. So once you're in there and you get your land and you set up your raised beds, because some of that land doesn't support crop very well, right. so you have to have yeah. raised beds. That's a good idea. And um, and you get your you know your your crops growing. How does part of your mission, as I understand it, is to get people to involved from the community, so they mm -hmm. begin to take pride in that mm -hmm. ab that ability to feed themselves. How does that work? How do you nurture volunteers? <clears throat> and how does can you well, talk a little about with the, that? Yeah, within the community. Uh, Again, one of the things that I learned in Africa was that you shouldn't rush into ground zero, okay, with your technology. Ground zero is, is in, in too much of a, a state of, of uh, insecurity, okay? So the places that, like buckets of rain or, or whoever, that you want to make a positive impact on somebody's life or health or whatever, it can't be in the area of, worse, of the most need especially in the third oh. world, because these people are living on the razor every day. If you introduce something to this system, their system, their social system, that doesn't, and it fails, <clears throat> you, probably, you, you stand a chance of, of hurting, you know, damaging a lot of lives. More than you would in other situations because they're already at risk. At, at ultimate ten. risk. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so that's why we try to look for areas that are not ground zero, but an area where what we have to offer meshes with what they're willing and able to accept. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that said, <laughs> Highland Park is probably ground zero. Yeah. The, the destruction and the lack of social coherent, uh, co cohesiveness uh, didn't really allow us to take the Victory Garden concept into the neighborhoods like mm -hmm. we want, because the uh. people who live on that block today could be completely different three months from now because they're all squatters. That's right. I see. Oh, I okay. see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so where are we going with this? When, when when we do see somebody who's who's showing an interest in growing their own food, uh, the problems that you face in Detroit and Highland Park is first of all uh, clean soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so or um, is that why you use raised beds? Yeah. Uh, you know, Detroit historically in the 1600s, 1700s has some of the most fertile ground is beautiful mm -hmm. Midwestern farmland uh, but in the city anymore you, you just don't know what's going to happen because when they tear down a house yeah. and they leave the basement they backfill the basement and level the lot and those trucks come in from nobody knows where mm -hmm. so if we were going to actually use the soil we'd have to take a soil test every like 20 feet yeah it's like let's not Florida. even go there right. uh, so we, we we bite the bullet we buy compost it, in the beginning, we had to buy compost. Now we make all sure. of our own because we have so much green, yeah. green yeah. manure that yeah, woo, yeah. we have, can't get rid of it. Uh, and so when people would come into the garden, we'd let them in one day a week because we do our community giveaway. And, and you know, and it's, everybody's excited. I want to do this. And it's like, well, I got good news for you. Open your trunk because we can put one in. We have a group of volunteers up here that would, would take, we take old pallets. We bust them apart. <clears throat> run them through our little factory in the garage and turn out modular raised beds and we give those beds to the community they can oh. put it because you don't put them together until you get them home so you know a honda civic could could carry th three raised beds and it costs us a dollar to make a raised bed three feet wide and six feet long so not all the gardening is done on your acreage it, people could take it to the take home. it home yep so this is a means for them to take home uh, to the, the means to create their own food. Yes. Yes. And we also supply them with, uh, you know, with the seedlings and mm -hmm. with support and mm -hmm. whatever. It's like 
but you know, we're not going to come. We're not going to come and weed, and we're not going to water <laughs> because you're like, you know, when you have a baby, do you expect the doctor to come and change the diapers? No, you have to do a little of this work on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, but the biggest uh, obstacle, I mean, we can give them a raised bed where they can put in it. Mm -hmm. So if you live in the suburbs, Royal Oak, Ferndale, you just go to the nearest city park and get free compost. Oh, Th wow. That is a luxury that the Highland Park in Detroit does not have. Okay. Uh, so what we started doing was, was we would take the next available flat space within sight usually. Well, that doesn't really matter because you don't really want to know what's going on when you're giving stuff away. Just give it away. Uh, but we start stockpiling compost that the neighbor, that the residents of our quote-unquote neighborhood uh, could get to with five-gallon buckets. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, they deserve everything that the people of Royal Oak deserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they just don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is a magnificent story of a way to help. my uh, and, and so within the garden, I want to go back to that volunteer mm -hmm. question. Who helps? <clears throat> the majority of our help comes from believe it or not, corporate America. A lot of corporations down there have uh, volunteer programs where, where mm -hmm. they go out and, you know, and interact with the, with the community. Uh, General Motors, Quicken Loans, Ford. Quicken Loans sends us two volunteer groups a week on Wednesday and Thursday, really? just wow. like clockwork. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So there's, we can make plans yeah. now. Yeah. You know, we're not sitting around going, boy, I wish we had some volunteers. It's like, no, they'll be here in 10 minutes. How many do you need, roughly? Um, we do probably 250 individuals per year, and we do 5,000 volunteer hours. Wow. Yeah. And I, what's I, your season? I mean, what? Ah, the beauty of it. Uh, you know, we're from Traverse City. You go down to Detroit, you have nine more weeks of growing season on the spring, you know, about four so and a half on each side. So we'll start planting down there in March. Oh, so we wonderful. need, when we, when, in March, you just do the real cold, hardy stuff. But when it's time to do the, our, the tender stuff, you know, the mm -hmm. tropical vegetables, then we try to align that with a day when we're going to get 40 volunteers in there mm -hmm. and try to, we'll plant the whole acre in, you mm -hmm. know, in a few hours, mm -hmm. God willing, and the creek don't So rise. I'm curious then, one of the ways to help that, that are happening is that you alert these corporations that you need volunteers for this particular work and mm -hmm. they, and then they come in. They do it. And they do the, the planning and the, and the, mm -hmm. the, Harvesting or anything, anything yeah. we need them to do. Uh, another big thing is to clear the sight lines around the neighborhood, so that uh, because the the rogue invasive plants will will take over oh, really sure. a lot in the course of a year. So and the and the police are, are they like that because when they want to see where the which way the bad guys turned. So just the debris removal, and of mm -hmm. course we turn that all into compost too. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge. Uh, amount of labor gets what, sucked mm -hmm. up into that. What percent of the um, volunteer work is done by people who are recipients of this bounty? Uh, pretty much none. Really? Yeah, most of our recipients are, are old. Okay. Uh, and you're talking Ill. particularly about the homeless population. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The population of our neighborhood is, uh, is, is, is infirm. Okay, I, when I say that, I mean they're uh, Everyone walks on a cane. Diabetes is an age issue. Every, you know, everyone has led a life that up to this point has has been hard. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really bother me at all. Mm -hmm. no, I if I was if, if I was in another neighborhood, it'd be a completely different story. I can only tell you about Detroit yeah, Highland Park or yeah. Highland Park. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, other, you know, you because in Detroit, when you go a couple of blocks, the entire world changes. Right. Mm -hmm. There's so many neighborhoods. Oh, yes. And some have community uh, block uh, mm -hmm. associations, and some do not. Mm -hmm. We happen to work uh, again, maybe in a place that's a little too rugged compared to, you know, to for us to reach all of our goals. Mm -hmm. But definitely, since we can't ourselves be physically present, maybe in a in a in a neighborhood where they could mobilize a volunteer army. Mm -hmm. We work with other groups. We supply, you know, like the like the Huda Clinic and the uh, Grant uh, Community Fund. There's just anybody who even says, you know, we got some people, we want to do this. Yeah. And we'll just say, well, where do you want to do it? And then we'll bring all of our equipment over. We'll get them over the hump because we know that the spirits are broken, you know, in the first six weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if we can 
we can show them that uh, you know they're, that they're not alone, and if you just acquiesce to the idea that you're going to have to deal with some weeds once in a while, that everything will be okay. <laughs> the farmer's pain. Yeah, you know, because we have equipment and we have the we've made all the mistakes, so we have the you expertise. Have the expertise, yeah. yes, my gosh. And, uh, and that's really rewarding. You know, we put put in little gardens at churches and stuff, so other communities are able to mobilize. Well, people. this is what I think I'm finding very interesting about this conversation is you're not talking about individuals so much as how you spread the ways to help mm -hmm. to other communities. Mm -hmm. So you are setting a model. Yeah. We hope that could be used all over the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so other the real the real way to help here is that uh, it, that I'm hearing is that other communities then Take, come to you and they say, okay, you say, look at this, look at this. We're focused on the production gardens, focused on the homeless, mm -hmm. and then you have these other gardens, the community gardens that are for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and this is how, and we're involving the corporations in mm -hmm. this way, and this is a model, right, yeah, yep. to take. Yeah. Uh, corporations and churches and block clubs, uh, th that's gonna be the best way for us to export what we're doing from, from Highland Park. I, I mean, mean, if you can make it work in Highland Park. I know. I can make it work that anywhere. Seems, really? Yeah, yeah because mean, once you cross the line into Detroit, all of a sudden, the, even the, you know, the attitude of governments and everybody has improved. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Have you seen uh, attitudes or involvement or um, anything improve in Highland Park since you've been doing this? Yes, definitely. Share that. Uh, when I first got there, <laughs> Uh, I, I, you know, I, I was probably known by several nicknames, none of which we could mention on TV, and, mm -hmm. and none of which I particularly cared for. But I realized that just comes with the territory. Um, so, so <clears throat> as years went by, all of a sudden, we're we're more accepted, okay. and to the point now where everybody used to wander by with their head down or looking the, they wouldn't even glance our way slash my way. Uh, and now they stop by and we give hugs, you know. So mm -hmm. if that's a measure of, that's got to be some sort of measure of some sort of accomplishment, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, mainly just through stick to itiveness and, and true, um, I think we have a, a pretty true concern for the well being of the people that we, we serve. Uh, we've, we've, um, <clears throat> we've, we've sponsored a lot of wakes. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a few funerals, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that, that we let the community know. Isn't that know interesting? That, yeah. that, you, that that's a way that the community knows that you are in in a relationship with them. Yeah, and more than just giving food, you know. Right. But, but uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, repairing their porches and things like yeah, that. Yeah, you've, also, you've yeah. embedded yourself kind of into the community. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Tried. Yeah, and it's been wonderful. I mean, I live after now. You know, since the initial. <clears throat> Uh, stay across the street from the garden in the in the shelter. Uh, you know, I have a, a room in a in Royal Oak, mm -hmm. but like last year, last spring, seriously, I was thinking, you know, I want to move back into the shelter. I, I don't want to live out in the suburbs. I'm more at home here. <laughs> what did you learn living in the shelter? Well, it was a veteran shelter, and yeah. the th and the thing, the harsh thing that I learned, and it was all men. No, I shouldn't say that. One of the floors <clears throat> was men with children, wow. but there were no women at all. We do serve, we have gardens at, uh, at women and children shelters because the Detroit Rescue Mission services the entire, uh, the entire spectrum of homelessness. But since I was in a male one, and especially veterans, I was able to see that, that most homeless people are, are not, uh, of course, they're not, uh, they're not lazy. And they're not just, you know, they didn't, a lot of times they didn't get there because they made a mistake. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of illness, mental illness in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, this is just our little world, but when people would say, well, let's use the veterans across the street in the garden, it'll be great therapy for them. And it's like, mm, no. Maybe not. No, we, no, it didn't work. We tried that. And... Uh, why wouldn't it work? Well, they're they're trying to get back into society as a rule that that, that person is very needy, very clingy, and uh, and if things you know and very still kind of combative, okay. you know, kind okay. of kind of angry is sure. the word, you know, oh. and uh, it's just not my job. I grow food. Yep. I'm not a social worker. Yeah, you're. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, across the street, 
they got social workers. But we just, because we deal with church groups and the corporate America, I just, I couldn't have people with mental illness wandering around the garden. Mm -hmm. I, th I can, I understand, I understand the risk. That's unfortunate in terms of the, the conflicting purposes, but, mm -hmm. but I, I can see if you're trying to, and especially because what people don't realize, I think, is how delicate plants are. You that know, too, it yeah. sounds so strange to mm -hmm. talk about that, but as a farmer, I, I sense that affiliation. And it, I know you say, well, what's that compared to a uh, human relationship? But the plant feeds the body, and the body then makes the mind. It's a little more convoluted, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, so, so that was harsh. We, were really, we really had you know, our rose-colored glasses on and thinking, man, we've got this. We've got all these wonderful veterans across the street. Uh, but again, they come and go every week, you know. And but you, you can't chose develop a to live with them. Hmm? You yeah. are choosing to mm -hmm. keep your your housing there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and how how does that give you an opportunity on a different level to help? On a different level, or maybe the same level? I don't know. Um, what was well, it? I know that, what, I'm asking. Why yeah. did you choose that? Well, I know what goes on behind the doors now. Yeah. You know, when you drive by and you see the locks and the and the gate, well, I, I know what they're doing in there. Yeah. I know all the good work that they're doing. And okay. it is, yeah. <clears throat> the beauty of the veteran shelter was that, you know, the Detroit Rescue Mission and for a while the VA, you know, they these guys, they got rides to their doctor's appointments. They got uh, t a tutoring on how, and they were enrolling in college and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but two or three of our most heart, uh, warming stories do come from the veterans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't want it to make it look like we That's, had no interaction whatsoever. Right. We had a one veteran who brought his children over every day, mm -hmm. uh, and they worked uh, every day in the garden. Um, I was I was Uncle Chris. They followed me around like the Pied Piper until I have to go like Isel. I can't get any. Could you get, put your kids somewhere? I can't get anything done. You know, <laughs> but they would ride their bikes around. Mm -hmm. So for a little while, we were starting to get kids in the garden, and that mm -hmm. was cool. Again, the transient nature of Highland Park. Kids one day, next day gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and Isel, they the Detroit Rescue Mission did give his family a home on the east side, mm -hmm. and he said to me that if it hadn't been the garden for the garden, um, he's not sure he could have held the, held the family together. So wow. there's a few yeah. of those stories too. But, you know, uh, we only make a difference person by person though. I mean, when yeah. we were talking about mentoring, it's the same thing. And, and, and in addition to that, um, you learn the limitations of what you're doing. I mean, mm -hmm. that's Indeed. part of it. Exactly, the, yep. The challenges and the limitations and, I mean, it's not all, um, happy ever after. Yeah. And yeah. we have that yearning for the story where, it, this is what we were talking about earlier with the, men, the story where everything comes all right in the yeah. end, you know, and, and it all comes back in the end. And But I think that whole idea of going in without expectation, choosing one way to help, thinking of that as this is my chat, task and this is maybe my calling, um, but I don't expect, I, I shouldn't expect the big Hollywood reward, you know, yeah. that you do, you do what you do. Yeah, you got, you stay fle stay flexible because where mm -hmm. you end up is probably not going to be a <laughs> yeah. where you were aiming. Right. <laughs> so then, how how do you keep going? Is it yeah. the little success stories I that tell keep you, you, Karen? Every day down there, I leave that garden and I'm just like on fire <laughs> because something little miracle happens every sure. day. Every day, I can't wait to get back. That's why I wanted to move back to that to that area because you know I, I do share a, a, I did develop a kindred bond with with what we call the Breakfast Club. Those are the those are the old boys who are mm -hmm. at eight o'clock in the morning are are sitting down at the dumpster drinking beer. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know every one of them gives me a shout out when I when I walk or drive by, mm -hmm. um, and I and I developed a sin, really a sincere like you know appreciation for the. Tr their ability to survive. You, bet. Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you know, it's it's so. not like, well, why don't you just, you know, why don't you go just? get a, why don't you just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's leave it right there. That's right. That's a good That's place right. to we'll leave that hanging. Why don't yep. you just? Uh... Mm -hmm. Affects your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. if, and this is the larger framework, the large, larger theoretical question. If someone wants to help, and they have. A, an, an inkling that it might be in gardens and it might be in feeding people in some way. And what, 
how how could they get involved with buckets of rain? Well, uh, other than writing a check, right, right, yeah. <laughs> which uh, is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, because these you know these plants don't grow themselves, and, right, and I right. think I think organizations that rely completely on volunteer. <clears throat> Uh, volunteering is that's nice but you, you, you're gonna limit your scope you know and eventually mm -hmm. you're gonna want to be bigger and you're gonna want to have somebody who's who's working for you all the time mm -hmm. and we're lucky now that after it's been 12 years but we have actually have four people that were actually putting money in their pocket you know mm -hmm. rather than just Beautiful. taking their yeah. time and patting them on the back at the end right, of the day right, right. Uh, so up north here, you got to think about where I am. I'm, I'm home. Woo! Yeah. Uh, we have a wonderful group of volunteers, uh, and, the, and the word is spreading. You know, spreading out. Yes, it uh, is. We're getting younger people uh, volunteering, and and uh, a lot of times they're just, you know, the younger people are passing through. The older people are 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 uh, doing it as a form of social, you know, mm -hmm. well because they know. That what they're doing is is super worthwhile, and they also they get together in a big group do? and they and they recently chat it up. Yeah, recently they were peeling apples. Yes, yeah. Uh, we have a you know we have a group that that will pull weeds all day, harvest all day, wash the vegetables, whatever it takes. So and they, since they it's travel time, down to Detroit. No, nope, we have separate groups for each for each area. I Although the Glen Lake okay. school teachers have been known to show up down there, yep, okay. and they're like. We want to do eight hours, and I'm like, well, I'm not sure I can go eight hours. And they were like, we drove all this way. We're working for eight hours. <laughs> but, but if I remember correctly, you had a community work yeah. bee where people, you had bushels and bushels of apples, yeah. and people, they were all, it was an applesauce making day. And mm -hmm. then that applesauce, mm -hmm. fresh applesauce, was taken to Highland Park mm -hmm. right, for, the, okay. for the homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. So food was being yeah. made and processed yeah, up here, but then being taken elsewhere. Yep, yep. The, one of our volunteers is driving a load mm -hmm. down today, as a matter of mm -hmm. fact, and they'll meet Tony down there and they'll... Uh, but you know, we have a program called Clinic to Farm to Patient because there's a free health clinic right across the street from us. So we are starting to, we've teamed with them and when they spot a patient, and I'm gonna get back to the applesauce. Okay. When we, when we uh, they spot a patient with a diet-related health issue, they write them this little prescription for vegetables, you know, it's mm. kind of a toy thing, but they come across and we give them a week's worth of food. <clears throat> that's, um, that's impressive. You know, and because they're suffering from diabetes or ob obesity or hypertension, whatever, um, uh, whatever the doctor deems them, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that this food, that this, this improvement in diet is going to make the biggest bang for the buck. And of course, I just right. wish they would just send everybody, but we got to start slow, right? Sure. Right. Uh, and the problem with that is winter. Mm -hmm. So we've got these patients that are making all this fabulous right. progress for seven, eight months a year. And then we have frost. And the, and the, the garden gate, shuts down. The gate slam closed. Okay, so we got to fix that. And the wonderful apple growers, you know, are among uh, of northern Michigan, are one of the ways we can do that. Now, you know, granted, it's just apples. I mean, we give out free apples until they they freeze. You know, where mm -hmm. we keep them, and then we make applesauce after they freeze. Uh, so it's a way of we, you know, we we're figuring out how to use the the, the bounty from other places sure. and get people to sure. give that stuff to us. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to wrap on the food. You know the the the, the food gleaning people. You know, but because uh, they're doing a great job of keeping food from being thrown out, uh, but we don't get any. Mm -hmm. You have to. And we have a direct <coughs> line to the people who need it the worst. And when I go somewhere and they say we give all our stuff to such and such, and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I get that, but you know, uh, they won't give it so to much us. Need. So much yeah. need again, yeah. yes. We need to wrap yeah. this up. Yes, this, this has been fascinating. Oh. I'm so grateful, Chris. Oh, gosh. And we will make sure the website. That was a quick. Um, I know, it just goes we, by. Well, we were, we were watching our time, and we. I just thank you so much for just coming on and telling us all these stories. It's, and It's bigger. The more I hear about it, the bigger it gets. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and it's gone out into these like fingers where now we're connected up north and, mm -hmm. and Detroit or Highland Park. and you know, homeless and clinics and the complexity mm -hmm. of helping, mm -hmm. I think, is um, something I'm really impressed with. I just admire your tenacity. <laughs> yes. I mean, in the face of so many challenges, mm -hmm. your commitment is just awesome. It, it beats working. 
<laughs> well, it is its own kind of work. Yes. Well, tell those volunteers that we're switch. We're out of apples, but we're going to start making them freezing smoothies, Great. and that's going to change the world. Wonderful. <laughs> freezing smoothies. I love it. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Chris. Thank you, guys. And we'll be right back for a debrief. Welcome back to Ideas Live. I'm Anne Marie Oman, and this is my co host, Karen Anderson. And we are here just doing the final debriefing on a fascinating, absolutely fascinating conversation with Chris Scalinger, who was the director, is the director of Buckets of Rain. And my word, talk about ways to help. The, the more he talked, the more ways emerged. I, I just loved it. I know, and the, and the sort of a multifaceted, unfolding process of interweaving community with clinics, with churches, with, with sponsors. corporate sponsors, with corporate volunteers, yeah. which fascinated me. And, and then the process, the connection to, for instance, even making applesauce up here, mm -hmm. which I thought was amazing and taking it then to homeless people yeah, in, in that, Detroit. There are ways to help no matter where you are. And what I especially appreciated about Chris's conversation is the limitations, where lines had to be drawn and where it was, the, the challenges became so um, hard that, that there had to be parameters set. Yeah, yeah. And, and we don't always hear about that. It's not going to work this way. We have yeah. to try this way or this way. Or maybe we can't do that. We have to do something else. And right. That flexibility and that tenacity yeah. are just really impressive to me. Right. And so as in terms of our series on ways to help, I think Chris kind of opened our eyes to how models can be taken mm -hmm. away yes. to other communities and also the, the, the willingness to be present to change. And to the actual um, place you're operating in, that each place is different right, and requires right. a certain exactly. level of responsiveness. Boy. Yeah, really impressive. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for rounding him up. And thank you for staying with us for our interviews on ways to help. Mm -hmm.